just how much pressure is there on Jordan Love to succeed this year? Plus, have we forgotten how good of a coach Matt LaFleur is heading into the 2023 season? All of that on today's show. You are Locked On Packers, your daily Green Bay Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski and I cover the Packers for The Leap a newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. I <laughs> today is is interesting and fun and I hmm I do my best to avoid the off-season clickbait that so often drives sports talk and you know, there are sites that are just going to put out stuff specifically to drive traffic, drive clicks, drive narratives. There are going to be segments done specifically to drive clicks, to drive narratives. I do my best to avoid them. But, but, <laughs> but, we're going to talk about two, two things today that are pretty classic sports talk fodder, but I don't want to do them because I want to debate the merits of the argument. I don't actually care that much about the merits of the specific arguments, at least those being made out there. What I want to do is I want to frame these questions about Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur through the lens of this season and the expectations that we ought to have as we look forward to 2023. And so let's start with the Jordan love of it all. And this is, of course, predicated on, if you didn't see it, Dan Orlovsky had a tier of quarterbacks that he felt like were under the most pressure this season. And he put Jordan love number one. That is absurd Okay, just on its face, absurd. I don't want to litigate the actual take that much because I just think on its face, it is absurd. I don't want to I don't want to compare Jordan Love to Dak Prescott or Kyler Murray or Justin Fields or these other guys that were on the list and how much pressure is on them. I think honestly it's axiomatic the differences between Jordan Love and those guys. Here's what I want to be clear about. Because as I pushed back on Dan's idea, I had people say to me like, you think Jordan Love is going to be good this year. So isn't that part of the expectation? And and yes, I think Jordan Love is going to be good. But the consensus expectation is that the Packers are going to be bad. And not just bad, but like bottom eight kind of team, bottom quartile kind of team. Seven and a half wins is the total at FanDuel. They are not expected to make the postseason. So the expectations for this team are not high. And I also think it's important that we understand This idea that I've talked about a lot on this show, this false choice that's being presented about rebuilding versus contending. No, they're not a Super Bowl contender. No, they're not a rebuilding team. There is this middle ground. And it's okay to be in that middle ground if you understand 
and expect to be there. What you don't want to be is a Super Bowl contender who winds up in that middle ground, especially when you've gone all in. The Packers last year had a very expensive team that won eight games. That's a really bad place to be. But the expectations for the Packers this year, the consensus expectations, not my expectations, maybe not your expectations, but the consensus expectation is that the Packers are not going to be a playoff team. They're not going to be very good. Eight wins, nine if they're lucky. Well, if that's the team that they're going to be, given what we know about what last season's team was as an eight-win team, defense is basically all the same group with some additions. Offense is not. So if this team is eight wins again, or even seven wins, a win less without Aaron Rodgers and Alan Lazard and some of the, the pieces, Randall Cobb, that they're missing from last year's team. That's not that big a step back. And presumably it will be because Jordan Love is, you know, meh. He's a, he's a quarterback. He's a guy. But if the expectation is the team is not going to be particularly good and forget the question of are they rebuilding, who cares? If the, if the consensus opinion, if the betting markets don't think this team is going to be very good, then inherently, necessarily, the expectations for Jordan Love can't be that high. And if that's the case, then there's not actually that much pressure on Jordan Love to succeed. If we don't expect you to be anything, then your failure to be that thing does not cause you pressure. If I go to Applebee's, they are not under any pressure to wow me with their food. Look, I like Applebee's. This is no shade at Applebee's. If they want to sponsor Locked On Packers, feel free. I love appetizers. I love potato skins. I love, I, I used to go to Applebee's in college all the time. Happy hour at Applebee's is a bomb place to be. But I don't have any expectations that they're going to wow me with Michelin star food. I don't expect molecular gastronomy at Applebee's. I expect chicken tenders, maybe a burger, French fries, and cold beer. That's it. I have pretty low expectations when I go to an Applebee's. Now, if they don't hit those low expectations, it's pretty bad, right? It's the same thing with Jordan Love. If you have mid to low expectations or something and they don't meet it, that's really bad and that'll be the case. That for sure will be the case with Jordan Love. But if I'm not expecting you to be the French Laundry, if I'm not expecting you to be Carbone, like, then I, there's no pressure. Most people think this team is going to be bad. I don't. I think this team is going to be good-ish. I think Jordan Love is going to be good-ish. But there's no pressure on him to do that if everyone thinks he's going to be bad or mid. There's If no one thinks you're going to be good and no one thinks you have to be good, then there's not pressure. Now, there is some amount of pressure from the fan base. That's not to say there's no pressure. Because this fan base expects him to show something. He did, after all, get drafted in the middle of a team figuring out, oh, we're actually better than we realized. And the Packers said, no, we're going to draft the quarterback anyway. So to justify the Jordan Love haters that were already out there, yeah, Jordan Love needs to perform at some kind of level to justify that draft position. But like... I've been saying this for weeks, months, maybe. If he's the 15th best quarterback in the league, if he's the 18th best quarterback in the league, this team can win eight, nine, 10 games, given the schedule, given the defense, given the run game, all those things. He doesn't have to be great. I have I have set what I think are eminently reasonable expectations for Jordan Love. I think he can be like this year, like the 12th best quarterback in the league. And go down the line, You don't have to get past, like, Mahomes, Burrow, Allen, 
Herbert, Rogers, Dak, Hertz, Lamar. How many more quarterbacks? How many am I missing that you're offended that I missed? Let's say I missed two that you're offended that I missed. That just like off the top of my head, I didn't think of. That's 10. I asked this question on Twitter a couple weeks ago. I said, how many, who, who is the best quarterback you wouldn't be surprised Jordan Love outplayed this season? I got a lot of Kirk Cousins. I got a lot of Dak Prescott. Guess what? Dak Prescott is like the second best quarterback in the NFC. He might be the best quarterback in the NFC. So if Jordan Love is that, even if he's behind seven AFC quarterbacks, this team is probably going to be decent, decent to good. But the expectation is not 2020 Aaron Rodgers. It's not 2011 Aaron Rodgers. It's not a recreation of the 2010 Packers where you go win a Super Bowl. Literally no one is expecting that. And that's that's good. That's reasonable. Forget the rebuilding or not. I don't care. Those people are wrong. The Packers are not rebuilding. And I, I don't, you just like, they're not. They're in that middle tier of teams. That is where we're setting the expectations for Jordan Love. Don't be terrible. Don't be in the bottom quartile. Don't be in the Zach Wilson tier of quarterbacks. But you also don't have to be in the Mahomes, Burrow, Allen tier of quarterbacks. So that puts you in the middle, in the Derek Carr, Kirk Cousins tier, Jared Goff tier of quarterbacks. That tier is like 20 guys. He can be in that tier. Those are reasonable expectations. And if he is, that's fine. That's fine. And so given that, Again, there's not that's not to say there's no pressure on him, but there's not a lot of pressure on him. He's getting this two-year audition window. Yes, he's replacing Aaron Rodgers, but no one is expecting him to be. No one, not one person, except maybe Jordan Love, is expecting him to be 2014 MVP Aaron Rodgers. No one is expecting that of him. Meanwhile, Justin Fields is getting MVP buzz. Oh, he could, he could be in the conversation this year. Okay, then he better be good. That's pressure. Kyler Murray, if Kyler Murray isn't great this year, the Cardinals might have two top five picks. They could go get Caleb Williams, Drake May, whoever they want. That's, that's real pressure. That's real. I know he got paid, but that's real pressure. Daniel Jones got $160 million. For on, a, on you know like on a performance that I did not think warranted that kind of deal on a team that expects to go make the playoffs, they're probably not, frankly. And when when they don't, and when he doesn't perform at a Pro Bowl level this year, people are going to go, "Hey Daniel, what the heck? We paid you all this money. We expected you to be a franchise quarterback, and you're not." Okay, well, the, the, first of all, that's a you problem. But the expectations are much higher. They're not. For Jordan Love. And so this is precisely the point. He can't be under some immense pressure if really it is the case that no one expects him to be, you know, elite. Speaking of elite, today's episode brought to you by friends at Built Bar. Built Bar, elite, as elite as elite gets when it comes to delicious snacks that also help you avoid the sugar and the calories. I had one today. I had one yesterday, I had one the day before that, I'll have one tomorrow. Because I love them. I love them very much. Because they are healthy and taste amazing. Covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, cookies and cream. I love all the puff flavors. That's what I stock consistently at my house. I've got the um, chocolate mint. I've got the cookies and cream puff. I've got the coconut puff. I've got the peanut butter puff. They all are just, it's banger after banger. 130 calories, four grams of sugar, 17 grams of protein. It is exactly what you are looking for. And now you don't have to go to built.com to get them. You don't have to wait on it. Just go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, walk in, buy your box, walk out. It's that easy. 
And thanks to everyone who makes Locked On Packers their first listen every day. Every day is next week on the show. A lot more to come. More OTAs conversations. Roger's signature series we're working on. Rookie orientation we're working on. A lot of fun stuff in the works here as we move forward through the off season. Okay, so this is another one of those um, sports talk segments. And I, again, I want to try and frame it in a way that does not make it a sports talk segment. The 33rd team put out a ranking of head coaches. And they had Matt LaFleur 17th. 17th. Okay. Brian Dayball was eighth. A team that didn't win the division. Matt LaFleur has won the division three times. A team that won one playoff game and then got absolutely boat raced in the divisional round. Matt LaFleur's team has won in the divisional round twice. And a team that is like even money to even make the playoffs this year with essentially the same roster and presumably a better roster with Darren Waller. One year in, he's a top 10 coach ahead of Pete Carroll, Doug Peterson. I'm trying not to get sucked into the sports talk radio thing, but Brian Dayball has not proven he's a better coach than Matt LaFleur. He just hasn't. This is recency bias nonsense. Mike McDaniel is ahead of Matt LaFleur. Mike McDaniel, at least Brian Dayball, went to the playoffs and won a playoff game. What did Mike McDaniel do except design some cool plays? Created some explosives with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell, the two fastest players in football. Congratulations. I think Mike McDaniels is a really good coach. He's a really smart, innovative, offensive mind. Matt LaFleur has been to the NFC Championship game twice. He's won 13 games in three seasons. What are we doing? Kevin O'Connell, one year, the luckiest, the luckiest regular season we have literally ever seen. One season, and he got embarrassed in the playoffs at home. He's ahead of Matt LaFleur. Dan Campbell, make the playoffs one time. What he has done culturally is really cool. What they're building is really cool. Have a good team, a legitimately good team one time. And we can talk about this. Three consecutive 13-win seasons. And one of those in 2021 could have been a 14-win season if they actually cared about winning in the last game of of the season, which they didn't. Why am I bringing this up other than because it's Sports Talk Radio? No. I'm bringing this up because yesterday we talked about this idea, or excuse me, two days ago, of the the change in Matt LaFleur's coaching and the need for him to change. What he did in 2019 coming off Mike McCarthy, a Super Bowl winning coach in a culture that had become reportedly by nearly every account, including the players on the team, toxic. You heard in the locker room, I was there for that Seahawks game when they won it. Guys like David Bakhtiari, Brian Bulaga, Zadarius Smith, Aaron Rodgers, to a man talking about finding their joy again playing football. This has been written about. This has been talked about. What Matt LaFleur did to empower the players was remarkable and turned that team around immediately. And yes, he had Aaron Rodgers. But Aaron Rodgers did not look like Aaron Rodgers in 2018. He was hurt. Aaron Rodgers did not look like Aaron Rodgers in 2017. He was hurt. Aaron Rodgers didn't look like Aaron Rodgers for most of 2016, except the run the table stretch. And Aaron Rodgers did not look like Aaron Rodgers in 2015. I think in retrospect, you go back and you look and you go, 
it had gotten a little bleaker than I think a lot of us, including me, were willing to admit at the time. And there were reasons for it. Mike Sando wrote about it. He actually watched some tape of the 2018 team with some, some NFL people. And they were like, look, this, some of this is route running. This is drops. This is, you know, Rodgers is still Rodgers. And he proved that in 2020 and 2021. But he wasn't great in 2019 either. But they won. He assimilated Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith and Adrian Amos and a new offensive philosophy. And they won 13 games the next year. They assimilated that philosophy even more. In fact, Matt LaFleur took control of that offense. Matt LaFleur was an enormous reason why Aaron Rodgers went out and played at an MVP level in 2020. That 2020 team to date has been the most pure distillation of the Matt LaFleur offense. And for whatever reason, Rodgers had his hissy fit in the the 2021 offseason They pulled back in 2021. They pulled back even further in 2022 toward what Rodgers wants to be in. Matt LaFleur was a huge part of the Aaron Rodgers turnaround. You can't just say, oh, it was Aaron Rodgers because guess what? Mike McCarthy had Aaron Rodgers and he got his ass fired. In part because Rodgers had tuned out Mike McCarthy and Matt LaFleur had to come in and prove himself to Aaron Rodgers. You hear the reports out of New York right now. Rodgers is running offensive meetings in New York. I don't say that lovingly. I don't think that's how this should work. Coaches are paid to coach. I think it's important for quarterbacks to have say and to get their guys on the same page and understand this is what we want. This is what we're trying to accomplish here. But you have to be able to coach that quarterback too. And listen, what I have heard about the Matt LaFleur era, he managed Aaron Rodgers well. Now, you know, were there some things that maybe I, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen done differently? Maybe, but I, you know, I'm not in those rooms. I don't know how Aaron Rodgers functions best. I would love to get, you know, about half a bottle of bourbon into Matt LaFleur and say, okay, you know, were you, did you not make corrections on Aaron Rodgers in front of the team because you didn't think he would respond well to it? Were you, were you manipulating him a little bit? That would be good. Or were you afraid to confront him? I don't know the answer. I don't have a lean on the answer. I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated to know, but that's my understanding is the standard for Aaron Rodgers in these meetings was different for everybody else. I, and I can't say for good or for ill because I don't know, but I know it was different. And guess what it did? It worked until it didn't. But is that Matt LaFleur's fault? That Aaron Rodgers took the money and ran? Go on, take the money and run. Is that that Matt LaFleur's fault? That Aaron Rodgers didn't want to work with his rookie receivers? Is that Matt LaFleur's fault? That Aaron Rodgers didn't want to run the ball even though running the ball last year was the best thing the offense did? At a certain point, you are the head coach, right? And so, you know, I said this last year, at a certain point, you have to take responsibility. At a certain point, the failings of Aaron Rodgers, his leadership styles, all those things are reflected on the coach because it's the coach's responsibility to say, I'm in charge. Look at me. I'm the captain now. And you're going to listen. The problem is you have no recourse. You know, like when you're a parent, You can tell your kid, look, either you listen or, and there's consequences. That's not the case in NFL football. It's not the case in professional sports. It's not the the case in a lot of ways, in a lot of professional um, endeavors where you have bosses who are really less powerful than their employees. And the coach in this case, frankly, less powerful than Aaron Rodgers, less standing in the NFL, less standing probably within the organization in a lot of ways. 
how do you manage those situations? Well, maybe you do it exactly the way Matt LaFleur did it and you manage that ego. This is a big season. We talk about pressure with Jordan Love. Matt LaFleur, to me, is under way more pressure than Jordan Love. And those are related because it is partially Matt LaFleur's responsibility to make Jordan Love look good. Because Sean McVay did it with Jared Goff. Kyle Shanahan has done it with a bevy of mediocre quarterbacks from Brock Purdy to Jimmy Garoppolo, et cetera, et cetera. CJ Beathard, Nick Mullins. Mike McDaniel did it with Tua, a limited physical player. Kevin Stefanski went to the playoffs with Baker Mayfield. Kevin O'Connell, 13 games. As lucky as that was, they did it. Fraud. Frauds. Frauds. Still, they did it. Okay, Matt LaFleur. Let's see what you got, baby. All right, thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. Every dayers. So much more to come in the coming weeks. Um, please go check out Locked on Sports today. It is um, my baby. It is a great time. We've got so much stuff going on right now. NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs. Baseball is heating up as the weather heats up. So under 20 minutes, we get you all the big news in the world of sports. Go check us out. Go subscribe. Uh, anywhere you get podcasts. Okay, we're going to be back next week. So much more to come on Locked on Packers as OTAs push on as we get to mandatory minicamp where we get to see everybody on the field at once. Rogers Signature Series coming up. More rookie orientation coming up. So much more. We got a a ton more interviews that we're working on scheduling. We're going to have a really, really fun off season. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you will find Locked on Packers. And anytime you want to come hang out with us live on our YouTube page, we're going to do that soon. We're going to do a live just for fun, just for the sake of being live. So you can stay Locked on Packers.